So welcome everybody to our uh, March virtual luncheon here, our, our annual meeting with the chancellor. The chancellor is gonna come on some, sometime between uh, 10 and 11, but she wasn't gonna be here right at the beginning. Uh, so it's obligatory in any conversation today to start with, so have you gotten your shots? <laughs> All right. So actually I suspect almost, almost everybody in here has probably gotten two at even the uh, under 75 people. Uh, it was really good that the university gave it to the emeriti because uh, especially for those of us in the under 75 group, uh, that, was a, that was the best source. Um, uh, one other thing is just, uh, if you, you know that in your little box here, you can, uh, the, the three little dots in the up, upper right hand corner, one of your choices up there is rename. If for some reason you're not named properly, especially if you wanna ask a question to the chancellor, et cetera, and she'd like to see who everybody is, you might put your correct name up there. Uh, Lori Kletzer, the provost EVC, is also going to be joining us uh, for this for this meeting. So just just a couple of general items. One is, as you may well know, uh, Ed and Miriam Landisman have given an endowment to the Emeriti Association, fifty thousand dollars, and we get the income to help support uh, our activities. And in a recent discussion with with Ed. He was saying that one of the reasons they did this was to basically give a pot of money that other people could add to. You know, they're, they're, they don't feel proprietary about having contributed all the money to the Landisman Endowment. And so as we go forward and solicit membership renewals, et cetera, uh, we're probably gonna try to make it a little bit more explicit that if you wanna donate some money to the support of the Emeriti Association. A good way to do it is just designate that you want it to be added to the endowment and we can do that. And we wanna thank Ed and Miriam for their gift. Um, among other things, you know, when we go back uh, in the fall and I'm getting more optimistic that our September meeting may be an in-person meeting, you know, with everybody vaccinated. I think there's a good chance that that's gonna happen now. But we may want to, to retain the Zoom option because it has allowed people to participate who are out of town or not well enough to travel and uh, having a little bit of money to enable the technology to do this is, is one possible use of, of our endowment funds. Uh, so what's coming up in April is the second of our two annual Emeriti lecturers and this is going to be Paul Lubeck from Politics. Paul is going to be talking about his, his work in Africa. And Paul says that his aim here is rather than the usual gloom and poverty picture that you get, he wants to prevent a positive story about some really good economic developments that are occurring. And, and his focus is going to be on uh, Nigeria. Uh, and then in May, we'll have our, our, our final luncheon of the year, virtual luncheon, still in Zoom, I'm sure. It'll be our annual business meeting and a professor from history, Greg O'Malley, will, will be our speaker. Okay, so I want to today uh, announce the winners of the awards that we give each year. So I, I'm gonna just go in and, and put this up on the screen here. Go on my share, go into my desktop, open up this Word file here. So for this year, the Panunzio Award, this is a UC-wide award, and each campus is allowed to make one nomination. Uh, in recent years, they've been selecting two people. For the Panunzio Award this year, our our nominee is Catherine Cooper from Psychology. And what we're gonna to do today is I'm going to uh, have each of these people just give a short brief summary of what they're doing. So let me run through the, the uh, list first and then we'll have the presentations in this award. The Dixon Awards, which are uh, reviewed by a committee from the Emeriti Association and the Handling and Administration of the Award is, is done by the Senate Committee on Emeriti Relations. So the, the awardees for this year are Dana Frank in history, 
Tom Pettigrew in psychology, and Karen Yamashita in literature. And we're gonna have each of them uh, tell us a little bit uh, about what they were doing. And let's get right into that. And so uh, Catherine, why don't you tell people, Catherine is our, our nominee for the Panunzio Award. And she made it a, an excellent package that we have sent on. So Catherine, unmute yourself and tell us about what you're working on. Thank you so much. And uh, good morning, everyone. And it's a pleasure uh, to be here today. Uh, just very briefly, uh, in 87, I came to UCSC as a professor of psychology and founding director of the doctoral program in developmental psychology, which focuses on cultural processes of human development. And I just want to say that it's launched generations of faculty who have diversified the professoriate in many other institutions and who work with low-income, ethnically diverse communities in U.S. and in internationally. And I'm currently a research professor of psychology and faculty director of the UCSC Educational Partnership Center, as well as research advisor with the Hispanic Survey Institutions or HSI leadership team. My research focuses on how low-income, minoritized, and immigrant youth forge their identity pathways to college and careers without giving up their ties to their families and cultural communities. I developed the Bridging Multiple Worlds theory to map this process and launched the Bridging Multiple Worlds Alliance, an international network of researchers, educators, and policymakers who work with P20, that's preschool through graduate school, alliances to support youth building their college and career pathways. I also developed a new tool called the Integrated Logic Model so that P20 alliances that house multiple programs to open college and career pathways could align and build synergy among their programs. With my Dixon Emeritus Award, I'm from a prior generation of these awards, I worked with 15 P20 alliances to develop and distribute the integrated logic model and related tools and published a paper about the experiences of six of them with this new tool. To give you a flavor of our work, I'd like to show you a three minute video that I developed with my Dixon Award from a paper about one of these alliances in collaboration with Elizabeth Dominguez, the director of the Cabrillo Advancement Program at Cabrillo College and her team, students and families. We launched our partnership in 1994 and it continues to evolve today, including through this pandemic. I welcome your questions and comments uh, probably with email, and I appreciate very much the chance to share this work with you. So now I'm going to, uh, I guess I'll share the screen. Just learned how to do this. Share, share, share. And um, looks okay. good. Yeah, good. Many countries hold the ideal that all children have equal access to schooling and advance through individual merit. But in reality, as children from low-income, ethnic minority, or immigrant families face poverty, discrimination, and schools with scarce resources, they are less likely than middle-income students, whose parents know about college pathways, to make it from elementary school to college, a pattern called the academic pipeline problem. How can students beat these odds and navigate the academic pipeline to become the doctors, lawyers, and teachers of tomorrow? To answer this question, a research team looked at the pathways of children in the Cabrillo Advancement Program, or CAP, at Cabrillo College in Aptos, California. This program partners with the Bridging Multiple Worlds Alliance, which brings together scholars, educators, and policymakers with students, families, and schools to help students build pathways to higher education without losing ties to their families and cultures. The Alliance draws its name from Bridging Multiple Worlds Theory, which examines the pathways of culturally diverse students in relation to their demographics, aspirations, math and language skills, challenges and resources, and cultural partnerships as students forge college and career identities. The CAP program primarily serves low-income U.S. Mexican immigrant youth, providing everything from scholarships to an annual summer institute to build knowledge about college and career options, taught by program graduates and university and community partners. The program also collects data to follow the students' pathways. 
From six longitudinal studies of these data, the researchers gained insights into students' aspirations and challenges, as well as their access to college-going resources. The studies, which span from childhood to early adulthood, revealed two major themes. First, students maintained agency in navigating ever-changing experiences that tested their social capital, sense of alienation, and feelings of belonging. As 12-year-olds, they showed initiative by applying for the program. As 15-year-olds, they ignored peer pressure to ditch. As 18-year-olds, they pursued scholarships, refusing to let financial worries hold back their dreams. And as 21-year-olds, they chased second chances when needed, taking entry-level jobs and mastering new academic skills. Mm -hmm. Through these years, their families were their greatest resource. Second, many graduates gave back to their communities. They became cultural brokers, guiding family and friends to college, and institutional agents, working as teachers and school counselors. In this way, they helped transform academic pipelines for the next generation. By showing how students navigate challenges and resources across cultural worlds along their pathways, these studies reveal important guiding principles to help open academic pipelines in multicultural nations. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much, Catherine. Okay. All right, Dana, you're next. I thought I was last. Hi. <laughs> I, uh, actually, I it, you're you're right. I had it, Karen. I'll, I'll stick to my yeah. Karen, you were going to go next. Yes. Yeah. You're right. All right. Um. Thank you. I'm I'm really honored for the to uh to receive this award. I I just recently retired and I'm very busy and um this this will really help me out. It's a great boost to to my work. Um. I, I'm just going to read from the proposal a couple of paragraphs because it's the most succinct way to talk about it um, because it's uh, it's pretty complicated. Uh, at the outset of World War II, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed on February 19th, uh, 9, 1942, the Executive Order 9066, which authorized the removal and incarceration of all Japanese Americans on the West Coast. 120,000 Japanese Americans were removed from uh, designated military areas to inland camps. In the next year, the War Relocation Authority had the task of determining the loyalty of their inmates in order to release them for productive, normalized lives outside of camp. Uh, those who had offers for jobs and education outside and those who would enlist or enter the draft for military service. The loyalty questionnaire was distributed to assess loyalty. While many of the questions seemed innocuous or about contact with Japan and its traditions, two questions in particular, question 27 and question 28, about the willingness to serve in the US military and for swearing any allegiance to the Japanese emperor, were confusing and divisive within the incarcerated communities. The answering of these two questions, yes, yes, or no, no, created rifts within families and friends um, with hostile and traumatic divisions that resonate to this day. This project will research and extract archival documents to track the origins of this questionnaire and uh, these two particular questions. Um, so the, the name of the, in fact, I didn't tell you the title, the, it's called the Japanese incarceration and the origins of the loyalty questionnaire. So why am I doing this? Because I'm, I'm a writer and I, I do creative work and I've, I've known for my novels. So I'm interested in the cultural nuances and sociological and anthropological anthropological studies that accompany these questions. In my previous work, in particular letters to memory, I explore the question of loyalty in my own family. I also write about Japanese American incarceration and its connection to the larger civil rights movement. I believe there are also close connections to Native American histories, land appropriation and military occupation as the internment camps were built over ancient indigenous, however assumed empty sites. I'm interested in the close encounters of salvage anthropology with military occupation. 
I believe the loyalty questionnaire may be a point of entry through which to understand what happened and how an idea became a policy. While I'm a writer of fiction, my writing has always been founded in close historical research. And I hope to use this investigation to creative purpose. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Karen. Thank you. Okay, and so next is Tom Pettigrew. Uh, you can uh, unmute yourself, please. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I am ready. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> I'm deeply honored to receive the uh, Dickinson Award. And so briefly, let me describe what I will do with the award. At 90, I've been studying American race relations for almost seven decades. Together with the research assistant provided by the grant, I plan to record the racial changes in America since 1960, involving health, education, crime, economics, and other realms. Two guiding points will be emphasized. First, I'll focus on the Black Lives Matter movement, BLM. It has attained surprising heights, but can it convert its thrust into policy changes that improve the lives of minority Americans. Now the widespread participation of white Americans in the BLM demonstrations is new. It's a marked change from the past. Today's many white protesters will long recall their involvement and form the white core of future pro-change advocates. And this protest participation explains why uh, there is strong white support for BLM despite false claims that it is causing massive violence. Movement leaders uh, have wisely now called for a shift in focus to meaningful policy change. But the shift from protest to policy is neither easy nor simple. The 1960s civil rights movement, most uh, important advance was the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And Biden's solid vote uh, recently reflected this, his overwhelming support from voters of color, thanks to that act. Second, I'll examine my contention that housing segregation is the linchpin of racial problems, uh, of linchpin of discrimination against African-Americans. It directly addresses the racial problems of other institutions. Given the nation's neighborhood schools, Racially segregated housing uh, translates into racially segregated schools. And with African-Americans forced into ghettoized areas, discriminatory gerrymandering is easier to execute and restrict minority political power. Moreover, social psychology has demonstrated that intergroup contact is an especially effective means of alleviating prejudice, but neighborhood segregation prevents this major means for achieving optimal interracial contact. So there we have it. Segregated schools, reduced political power, continued racial prejudice, and other institutional problems can all be traced back in part to segregated housing. So my project will con concentrate on housing, where the current race pace of improvements would require more than a century to reach complete integration. Thank you again for the Dickinson Award. All right. Thank you, Tom. I uh, I want to be doing that when I'm 90. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dana. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And I have to say that on that B90 thing, um, I just turned 65 the day they opened the vaccines to the 65 year olds. And it's a little interesting for me to be here with the Emeriti. Um, with professor, people who were professors when I was a student at UCSC in the mid seventies. And so it's like, I'm a member of a different club here and I know other people that were, I think might be true of Karen Bassey too. Right? Um, so just thank you so much for the donors and the money and for choosing me. It really means a great deal to me. I usually did US history through most of my life but for the last 20 years I've been working on Honduras human rights and US policy and I'm returning here to US history. And so it's really great to feel validated. And I'm very moved that people appreciated my work. Um, and also, thank, I do really appreciate the money, because as I said before, it's costing a lot of money to buy books, to pay people to go into an archive, all kinds of things that research expenses that are really 
suddenly uh, almost prohibited. And so I also really appreciate the money. Um, um, what I'm writing is a series, a book that um, I have a contract with Beacon Press, a popular publisher I've worked with before. And I'm writing a series of essays about ordinary people and their survival and activism in the 1930s and the relationship between that and the New Deal state and the extent to which the New Deal did and didn't serve those people. And I'm being very diverse in my approach to um, who people are. Part of my story is, part of this is really pitched for young people to learn about some basics about the New Deal state, um, both the fact that ordinary people and their protests created many of the key measures by mass protests from below like social security, or unemployment insurance, but also the new forms of institutionalized racism through the New Deal labor system and um, exclusions from social security and unemployment and the, the National Labor Relations Act. So at the biggest level, it's about that tension, but what I'm really doing is actually having fun writing some creative essays. I do a lot of creative nonfiction and popular writing. So really this is about writing some essays that um, it's not like a single textbook book. I'm having fun writing some reframing the questions through these um, essays and using literary technique and bringing in culture and all kinds of things. And obviously speaking to the present and trying to speak to young people in particular. And let me just give three examples uh, finally here of things I'm writing about. One of the chapters is called The Tale of Two Caravans and it contrasts the caravans, quote unquote, of uh, uh, Dust Bowl migrants from, the, from Oklahoma and Arkansas and Texas who came to California in the 30s, very famous through John Steinbeck and many other things with the caravans of Mexican and Mexican American people, over half a million that were rep repatriated and deported from the United States in the 1930s. And in fact, the um, to Mexico, and in fact, those Dust Bowl migrants got the jobs that the Mexicans were deported from. So I'm contrasting those two with individual family stories and their treatment in the media and in the, by the state. A second one that I'm working on right now is about a I'm interested in the labor movement and uh, the Wagner Act and the labor systems of the 30s and who they did and didn't serve. And I'm writing about a sit down strike in Chicago in 1937 by seven African-American women who worked as wet nurses selling their breast milk to the Chicago Board of Health and went on a sit down strike to get their wages up. So it's an unbelievable story, a great privilege to be learning about and tracking these women and their um, their workplace experience and where where did they you know who were they and why did they do what they did and to what extent did the labor laws and systems that developed in the thirties serve their interests as um, women working in what literally family labor and then I have another one that's about um, fascists white men in the upper Midwest that identify as fascists and their activism and also the ways that turns out uh, that many of them worked in government relief agencies. And I'm very interested in that contradiction there and how that fits into what we already know about how relief agencies um, were discriminatory against African-Americans and other people of color. So I'm really just um, trying to be creative here and explore some of these questions and speak to people and um, figure out what everything I can. So thank you so much, it really means a lot. Okay, well, thank you, Dana. So, so we have a few minutes before the chancellor is going to join us, and so that allows some some questions. So, if you have questions or comments, I want asking any of the the our award winners here. You can just mute yourself. Anybody have any anything they want to ask about this? Yeah, Dana, do you have an arch Do you have archives you're working with, or where where are you getting the material from? I know that you're, you know, <laughs> it's well, you know, there are, for the caravans, there's a lot of oral histories that are in our archives. I haven't tried to get those yet, but there are a lot of both, both of those stories, the two, the both the Mexican and Mexican Americans and the Dust Bowl migrants, there are a lot of interviews with people. Um, for the, the the wet nurses, I'm using the African American press and national. They were actually in the press a lot, and, and the census, which you can get online, um, and you know a lot of secondary stuff. Um, the fascists that that is in the FBI records that are available um, that that's been digitized. But there's still a lot of stuff I can't get access to because of lockdowns. Thanks. So, well, let, let me ask a question about that. This, this wet nurses story sounds fascinating. Was this African-American women serving as wet nurses to white children? This seems like 
this would be very taboo not very many years ago. Um, actually, it has a very long tradition under slavery. Um, mm -hmm. And then after slavery, both immigrant European women, poor women and poor black women in, in, in uh, worked most of the researchers on Chicago and Boston selling their, they lived in homes like domestic servants, but they weren't allowed to bring their own babies and their own 90% of their own babies died. Mm -hmm. And um, and the one, then it transferred to a system of them um, expelling their breast milk through milk stations, quote unquote, in Chicago and Boston. And then that milk would go to women who had had premature babies or women who hadn't been able to um, provide um, milk to their own baby. So it's an unbelievable story, the whole history of wet nursing in this country and all over the world. And then but it, what part of what I am saying is this is like in some ways the most hyper exploited labor you can imagine. And yet these women were not victims. They had a very clear under their quotes from them in the press, their very clear sense of the power of their own labor and what they were providing and, and that they had a right to higher pay. And they drew on uh, spiritual traditions. They said things like, we're going to sit here until Gabriel blows his horn, for example. Uh, it's really an amazing, if you see the pictures of them, I have them up right here. They are the most amazing women. I have two different pictures of them from the newspapers at the time. They were in Life magazine. That's how I first saw it 20 years ago. I saw a photograph of them in Life magazine. Mm. Okay, other questions? So Karen, can, can you say more about those two questions? I mean, I know there's a lot underneath this, uh, the profession of loyalty or the proof of loyalty and how it can be um, ascertained by answering two questions, yes or no, or, you know, that they both, do they both have to be yes or they both have to be no? And, and anyway, just more about those two significant questions that your research is going to, uh, to look at. Right. Um, yeah, they were critical questions and they really confused the communities. For instance, the one question was about military service. And of course, when you're incarcerated, you wonder, are you, are you going to let my family free? Are, are, are we going what to, what does this mean? And so there, there were a number of uh, young men who said no to this question uh, on the condition that uh, their, their families and their community be free. Uh, and so they, they were draft resistors in that res sense and they were sent to prison for this. Um, or, <clears throat> or they became angry um, and they renounced their citizenship and went to a place called Tule Lake in Northern California, which was a segregation center um, and, and their families included. Um, and then the second question was about renouncing um, uh, any affinity to the Japanese state through the emperor. And their, pa their parents, uh, the, the first generation were not allowed to become citizens. So this was a, this was a very um, difficult question because if they renounced uh, loyalty to the, uh, the emperor, that, means, that meant that they would be a stateless. And so again, this caused um, great consternation and confusion. Uh, the, what happened in, in this is that folks who said yes, yes, um, and uh, you know, they, based on that, uh, the 442nd the, and the 101 were sent to uh, Europe. They were segregated unit of military um, uh, registered, you know, who registered for the, uh, for the army. Um, <clears throat> and they fought in Europe. And uh, when they returned, of course, they had great hostility, felt great hostility though, to those who did not sign up to serve. And, um, but of course, both sides had their reasons for what they did. Uh, but um, those things were a silent, um, div you know, division within the community of those who had said yes and those who had said no. Um, and uh, we see how that's played out. And um, so then over the years, and I, I, you know, most of my, my parents' generation have now passed. And, uh, but I know that they were um, at odds with each other. It separated families. Uh, it was a very disturbing and divisive uh, relationship that people had with the community, although it was always hidden, it's hidden. 
Thank and you. it came out during redress. Yeah. Well, well, thank you very, very much, Karen. So I see that the, the chancellor has arrived. Good morning, Cindy. <laughs> you... Good morning. Okay. Well, let me just give a, a, a very brief introduction here. I, I was thinking this morning that, you know, shortly you, you arrived uh, and then in January came to visit our Ameritai lunch. And I think that was the last one we had in person. Yeah. Then you were scheduled to talk to us in March and that, that was right on top of the shutdown day, I think. Uh, you know, we shut down on St. Patrick's Day. And I think, you know, the time passing has been so bizarre that it's hard to believe that you're almost two years into the job here and what a strange, peculiar time it has been. So uh, thank you for surviving all of this. And uh, thank you for uh, coming and talking to us today. So, so with that, uh, you know, we're, we're a pretty informal group here, but uh, I see, are, are you there in the chancellor's office? I, I am here in the office today. I very seldom come to campus, but today, exact, I, after the, our meeting together, uh, I have to make our annual strategy presentation to the office of the president. I see that George is here. George, you know exactly what that means. And normally we would gather around this large conference table in the president's office, we have to do it remotely. And, you know, like you probably experience, our internet at home is pretty good, but it sometimes is wobbly. And I just thought I can't chance uh, having our internet go down because it goes at the worst possible time, doesn't it? <laughs> so I'm in the office today and it's really um, a pleasure to be on campus. In, in fact, uh, Barry, you know, I arrived July 1st, 2019 and and so I have now passed the halfway mark of spending more of my time at home in the attic office than <laughs> it's, on campus. it's crazy. But uh, with vaccines becoming more available, we're really excited, you know, about the future. And I hope you are too. But I wanted to start um, uh, by offering congratulations and some thanks uh, to all of you. And um, I think, uh, I, I would like to really applaud our Dixon Emeritus Professor Award recipients this year. So proud of you. Uh, and I understand, Barry, that they have been announced. Is that correct? Yeah, so in the first half hour, they each give a, a presentation. And, and also Catherine Cooper, who is our nominee for the Panunzio Award, the system-wide oh. award. Well, congratulations to each of you. I got the tail end of the last presentation. Very interesting and, and important, uh, Dana, Thomas, Karen, and, and Catherine, that you continue to be active in your scholarship and research. It's really a testament to the contributions that our emeriti make to our campus. And I also wanted to just thank all of you uh, because I appreciate your commitment to and your continued engagement with our campus. Uh, in some cases, I know uh, that your engagement goes back several decades and your involvement and the institutional knowledge that you bring to the table makes UC Santa Cruz a much better place. And so I'm grateful for that. And um, on, a, on a sad note, I, I, I too wanted to acknowledge that we've been touched by a number of losses over the last year. At least a dozen of our emeriti have passed away in 2020. And these losses are each felt deeply. And I think it's important to acknowledge them. Um, the UC Santa Cruz of today is the cumulative result of the efforts of so many who have come before us. And I'm just grateful to be a part of this incredible continuum. And I'm sure you are as well. But today I wanted to cover a number of topics and then I'm happy to take your questions. Among the topics I'd like to touch on are our COVID response, um, our plans for fall, and uh, our long range development plan, the LRDP and our Student Housing West project. Uh, but I'd like to take a moment first uh, though to talk about my goals for the campus. Since, as Barry pointed out, we really didn't get a chance to gather last year as we normally would uh, for this lunch. 
um, and that because of the pandemic, uh, I, I thought it'd be worthwhile just talking about those goals. And I, too, I've been asked recently about whether my goals for the Chance campus have changed in the face of COVID-19, the wildfires, the general upheaval that 2020 delivered. And despite everything, they have not. And if anything, the fallout from COVID-19, the fire, the social and the civil unrest we witnessed, they remind me and you, I hope, what is truly important. And it is our mission and it is the impact that we have uh, here in Santa Cruz and around the world. Uh, student success is uh, uh, one of our top goals. We have done a great job for student success, but we have work still to do and we must better serve, especially our first generation low income students and those students who have been historically underrepresented in higher education. We know that universities, higher ed in general, have the ability to transform lives. That was the case for me and it probably was the case for many of you. And again this year, I'm proud that UC Santa Cruz ranked among the top five in the country for our contributions to social mobility, pointing to our success in admitting and graduating students who are from very low income families. I'm a first generation uh, student myself from a family of modest means and I understand the challenges faced by many of our students. But students today, um, they face bigger challenges than I think uh, students did a generation or two ago. And they need different support and they deserve robust support structures and new tools that will empower them to take advantage of opportunities. And so we need to make sure our students aren't disadvantaged by COVID or uh, um, that you don't have to start ahead to get ahead when you come to UC Santa Cruz. So I want to, uh, us to improve our graduation rates, our retention uh, rates year to year and, and reduce or eliminate uh, the achievement gaps uh, that we see in some courses and, and, and for students overall. Uh, by that, what I mean is that uh, we want students to have uh, equal uh, markers of student success in terms of their retention and graduation pass rates in courses regardless of whether they're first generation, low income, or for underrepresented groups. So uh, our Center for Innovations in Teaching and Learning has done great work in that area, as have many, many of our faculty, and we're on a wonderful trajectory. So I think that uh, we're, we're, we're doubling down on those efforts and great things lie ahead. Uh, my second goal for the campus is to enhance our research profile. Uh, I want to solidify our status as a research leader. And, you know, we're all so proud of our election to the Association of American Universities, the AAU. Uh, many of you uh, and your research profiles helped lay the foundation and contribute to that recognition. We are among the top 65 research universities in the United States and Canada. That's just amazing. and. Uh, the other thing that's unique is, I think you know that UC Santa Cruz is a minority serving institution. We're one of four Hispanic serving institutions who are members of the AAU. We were also selected last spring to join the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, which helps us advance our, our research profile on the global scale. Uh, we have uh, our first Nobel laureate on campus, Carol Greider, who joined our Department of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology. She's moving, moved her lab largely, a few things yet to arrive, um, is teaching and uh, mentoring students. And uh, she, um, as you may know, received the 2009 Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology for her pioneering work on telomeres, you may not know that since her arrival at UC Santa Cruz, she was elected to the National Academy of Inventors. So yet another uh, landmark achievement for us. And uh, very recently, we have our first Rhodes Scholar, Garima Desai. Uh, and she was one of 32 top scholars from around the US selected to have her expenses paid to attend graduate school in Oxford. There were more than 2,000 applicants, and so her selection 
as, uh, as a Rhodes Scholar is really a landmark achievement. As part of increasing our research profile, we should also acknowledge the importance that graduate students have in research and, and uh, in the life of the campus. So I talked earlier about undergraduate student success. We have to also be focused on graduate student success and professional development and uh, are planning uh, now to think about graduate program growth and what that means uh, in the uh, sort of post COVID uh, uh, experience. So uh, another uh, important aspect of research, uh, our research profile along with increased funding. Uh, we achieved again this year, a record in terms of new grants and contracts, new research expenditures since 2017, our, our research grants and contracts are up 54%. That's really a pretty amazing achievement. And so I'm very proud. That's all due to our faculty, right? And um, we have great faculty for sure. My third goal is to create an inclusive and diverse campus community. I think it's imperative that all the members of our campus community, students, staff, and faculty alike feel welcome and that they belong here. To solve the grand challenges we all face, we have to access the minds, life experiences of all Californians. And the Black Lives Matter movement has been an important movement for us in higher ed in general. Our university struggles with and works within the same context of white supremacist structures and conditions that make life more dangerous, precarious for people of color. And we are working as a university to, to translate our ideals, our values into action and sustainable change. That transformation takes work and we're still engaged in that work, but we have many uh, wonderful partners on the campus who are really leading the way in this effort. Finally, um, my goal is that we improve the overall efficiency and effectiveness of the campus. Um, you know, we have a small budget, we have to make every dollar count we have to have processes and procedures that are efficient and effective. But after the last year, <laughs> I'm adding adaptability and resilience to that set of goals. Um, our campus and our people have just done remarkable work in the face of the upheaval of the last year. Uh, I think we saw that most profoundly with the evacuation and then repopulation of the campus due to the CZU fire, which may have affected many of you, but also in our COVID response. And I want to make sure that our organizational structure and processes for the campus reflect the resilience we know we'll need for the future. Uh, more than anything, I think COVID has shaped the past year for each of us. That's true in our personal lives as well as in, in our campus life. And our campus committee, community looks different uh, now than it did a year ago. Um, we had about 1,500 courses offered this quarter, but only five were being held on campus in person, and that was about 50 students. Um, we had six in-person classes in the fall. We've reduced uh, the number of students living on campus. So in a typical year, we house about 9,000 students. Uh, right now, that number is about 1,500 we hope to be over the 2000 mark for the spring quarter and have some more students joining us uh, in, on campus housing. Our faculty and instructors uh, are really heroes. They've been working since the shutdown to update and upgrade courses. That's a never ending process really, especially in this uh, remote environment. The Center for Teach Innovations in Teaching and Learning, CIDL, really led that effort to make remote instruction effective, engaging, and interactive. And we're also being innovative in our efforts to provide support for students in other ways, uh, remote and online tutoring, advising, counseling, internships, student clubs, and more. The things are starting now to, uh, to become uh, a little bit more in-person. And, and that's going to be not a light switch, but a dimmer switch, the switch that will raise very, very slowly. Yesterday, we authorized our spring sports teams, which include volleyball, uh, track and field, and golf, to actually compete. So that's a real landmark for those teams. 
they'll be doing it with all the COVID precautions and, and hopefully staying safe. Uh, with uh, uh, the prospect of vaccines for everyone who wishes to have one, the system announced in January that instruction will be mostly in person in the fall. Um, we're still trying to figure out what fall of 2021 will look like. It won't look like fall 2020, I think. And it probably though won't look exactly like the pre-pandemic fall of 2019, but something in between. And uh, um, we had in May of last year created two task forces, one led by uh, Lori Klutzer, our campus provost CDC uh, on academic recovery and resilience and the other on organizational and employee recover and resilient, recovery and resilience. And that's led by Sarah Latham. The purpose of those task forces then was to help us manage this shift to remote instruction but now those, those task forces, which comprise about 15 sub subcommittees and over 200 members are hard at work planning scenarios for what our return in fall 2021 will look like. This is tricky because students have to soon enroll for fall 2020. And we may not fully know what the state and county or even CDC guidelines will look like, but uh, we are planning to have um, more in-person instruction and in-person engagement, more population of our housing, and still some pathways for students who might not be able to be vaccinated or would like to continue remotely for another quarter. Uh, all of this success at our campus over the past year has been possible because of the efforts of our faculty and staff who came together to create the molecular diagnostics testing lab. Uh, COVID testing what, um, is just continues to be important, even as we're getting increasing numbers of students and, and uh, faculty and staff, I hope, all vaccinated. So far, those of us who are involved in the educational operation of the university, faculty and staff are able to get vaccinated uh, through the state uh, education, higher education is included in that priority list. Students are not yet uh, eligible for large scale vaccination, but I'm counting that that will change by fall. Uh, we continue to test all students uh, living on campus, uh, but uh, of course, anyone who has symptoms gets tested at the health service. Right now, that's, a, that's really um, not anybody, but uh, we're doing uh, asymptomatic testing of uh, students twice a week if they're, that, that's required if they live on campus or come to campus for research or other things. And uh, offer that testing also for our staff and for our students living in the community. This week I will share with you was a landmark week. After uh, some periods in December, late December, early January where we were seeing pretty high numbers of students um, being positive, uh, high populations in our quarantine and isolation space. The number of students testing positive in the last week was a big fat zero. And so that was just really a, a real um, uh, lift to all of us. And I think a good sign for the future. So uh, as we uh, now are thinking about uh, you know, the future, we, we do have to keep uh, paying attention to COVID testing. Uh, we worry about those variants that you hear about in the news. And I'm proud to say that our, um, our Genomics Institute is taking all of the positive tests uh, from our, from our uh, testing lab and doing sequencing on those to look for the emergence of known or new variants. That's very important work. And it, they're using the nanopore sequencing technology developed by David Diemer and Mark Akison here at UC Santa Cruz, another point of pride for me. Um, and so as we, as we think about the future, you know, that's a, a, a really, um, a, you know, an exciting um, trajectory, I think, for our testing facility. But you may know that we're not just doing testing for our campus. We've, from the beginning, had the plan of helping the community with that testing. 
And so we've done about 60,000 tests since the lab was started for our campus community. And we've done another 22,000 tests for our community partners. Um, and that work has been done with the Santa Cruz Community Foundation to whom we're really grateful. Uh, and we're providing those tests for Salud Per La Gente and Watsonville and to the Santa Cruz Community Health Clinics. And uh, they are then able to give tests to the area's most vulnerable uh, uh, individuals. And the campus does it at our cost. We're not seeking to make any, uh, any profit. Uh, you may know that we, we have begun administering COVID vaccines here on campus. Um, and uh, that was at first done with vaccines that we got through the UC Health uh, system. Now with the switch to Blue Cross and Blue Shield running the state vaccination programs, we are not able to get vac vaccine doses any longer from UC Health. We have gotten uh, um, doses from our county. Uh, once those doses are done, I think that our vaccine clinic may have to close. But luckily at the same time, we're seeing a big rise in the avail availability of vaccine out in the community through healthcare providers and even through pharmacies. And so I think that uh, um, it will be uh, this ramp up of vaccine delivery will, will, is, is great for the state and for the country. And uh, I understand that some of our American our Ameritai faculty were able to access their vaccines through our campus. So I'm really pleased that we were able to do that. And uh, you know that our, we have a um, pretty small student health staff. And so as we increase the number of students on campus, it'll be good if they can get out of the vaccine delivery business and go back to focusing on, on uh, the normal student health activities that they're engaged with. But I think that our, our university's approach to COVID testing vaccination is a point of pride for all of us. And I especially wanted to say how proud I am of our students. You know, we have had only about 1500 students living on campus. Our census is that there's between four and 5,000 living in the greater Santa Cruz area. And those students living off campus, uh, they've gone through our testing protocol on a voluntary basis. We have offered them the ability to do quarantine and isolation on campus and uh, uh, because many of them live in crowded, crowded houses. But uh, the fact that our students uh, didn't engage in the large scale parties and uh, super spreader events that we've seen from college campuses around the country, I am really proud of that. And I think it has pointed to their responsibility uh, as people and their commitment to keeping the whole community slug strong. So I wanted to uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about the long range development plan. And uh, a draft of that plan was released in January along with a draft of the environmental impact report which goes along with that plan. Uh, campus leaders and planners um, have been working on that for nearly four years. George, you started this, so thank you. And and uh, over that uh, period of four years, we had a lot of input from campus and community groups and the general public. Uh, the, the input uh, period for the comment period for that plan is now closed. It closed on Monday, uh, but we'll be going through all the comments that we received and, and incorporating those in, into the plan. Many of you probably know that uh, uh, these long range development plans are land use plans. Um, they stretch out in really broad strokes what our main campus might look like two decades from now. Uh, the plan designates specific areas on campus for search, certain uh, uses <clears throat> like learning spaces, dining halls, housing, recreation areas, open spaces. And uh, it also gives us a chance to really imagine uh, what the future might look like. Uh, so we do imagine as part of that plan that if we did have enrollment growth, we would add some residential colleges and there are locations that were in which those residential colleges might, might, might be. So uh, um, contrary to what some folks say, uh, this long range development plan doesn't mandate or approve growth. 
it simply lays out where the infrastructure to support growth might occur if it's needed and, uh, and funded. And so every project that's in the plan would have to have some level of environmental analysis and its own approval before any shovel was lifted. So what the plan does is to chart a sustainable and I think exciting course for our campus. The UC Santa Cruz of 2040 will be more accessible, functional and flexible. Our footprint remains compact uh, with new learning and research and housing spaces for the most part clustered in the existing academic core. New paths and street designs will make us more accessible, less car dependent. And a key point is that our aim is to house 100% of new student enrollment over the 19,500 students allowed in our current agreement with the city. That housing commitment not only lessens the housing impacts on the city, and, but traffic too. And the plan also calls for additional employee housing. It affirms our commitment to the college structure and, um, and really um, is consistent then with our value that uh, UC Santa Cruz must offer undergraduates a transformative experience, uh, those who enter as freshmen especially, of having that small liberal arts college experience with the rigor of a major research university. And all of the facilities in the plan will be integrated into the landscape itself, just as the campus founders first imagined 60 years ago and highlighting our longstanding commitment to the campus environment. If you'd like to know more about the plan and the accompanying draft environmental impact report, both are available online uh, at lrdp.ucse.edu. And if you don't remember that, a Google search will bring you right to our homepage. Um, I think that uh, even though the, the public comment period has closed, we're excited to be able to um, dig into all the comments and they'll be addressed in the final environmental impact report that I expect will be released later this year. We do have to take the LRDP and the final environmental impact report to the UC regions for approval and certification, uh, respectively. And so, you know, I think about this horizon of 20 years and just how much the last year changed our perspective on higher education and on life in general. Uh, 2020 should be a, a reminder that you can't very well predict the future. Um, regardless of that, we do have to have a well thought out roadmap that can serve as a guide uh, no matter what the year 2040 brings. Now, I wanted to close my remarks uh, talking about Student Housing West. Most of you are familiar with this project and we'll be bringing it back uh, before the regents for reapproval next week. Uh, you may remember the specifics. It's uh, more than 3000 beds, a new complex for students with families, a childcare facility that will be open to all employees, faculty and staff included. That project was approved in March, 2019, but then it was held up by legal challenges since then. Most of those hurdles were cleared by a judge this fall, but the court also concluded that there was some irregularities in the process the regents used when they approved the project, and that requires us to return to the board. Um, and I know, as most of you do too, that the project doesn't enjoy unanimous support. And um, I just want all of you to know that I have valued and considered all the opinions on this project. Since I arrived, I've studied it in depth. I've listened to both supporters and critics, dug into the, the details of the project, the financial analysis, and my goal was to try and find a project that would meet the project objectives and satisfy the concerns of our stakeholders. And the result of all of that uh, analysis, and, and I'll be honest with you, many sleepless nights, I ended up concluding that Student Housing West is the best path for us to deliver more desperately needed quality housing for our students at, as quickly as possible and at the lowest possible Price. And at the end of the day, that was the most important factor for me. Our, 
housing has been at a crisis point for Santa Cruz for a long time, I think, but it is worse now than it has ever been. Um, we've seen the results of the fire, which destroyed nearly a thousand homes. And um, now uh, folks moving increasingly to Santa Cruz from Silicon Valley is they would rather live here, who can blame them, uh, and uh, access work remotely. So with our mission and values centered, centered on student success, housing is really key to that. Uh, study after study has shown that students who live on campus are more likely to persist and graduate. And um, the other aspect uh, about this project is that it, it also helps us think about um, the, the need for uh, affordable and dependable student housing for our existing student enrollment. 47% uh, of our undergraduate students are Pell eligible from the lowest income families and or first generation students. They can't afford to compete in the Santa Cruz housing market. And uh, we, if we're going to close that equity gap I talked about earlier, we've got to be able to provide them on campus housing. Accessibility of childcare and is also really critical um, to the retention and recruitment of students but faculty and staff as well. And so uh, I think the, the new and centrally located childcare facilities that are part of this project will not only help us provide childcare for the children of employees, uh, in addition to students, it's, it's in a location that is also readily accessible to area schools and other services. So in 1988, I went to UC Riverside at age 30 to pursue my PhD. I had a little girl, a one and a half, and a little girl, three and a half. They're now in their mid thirties, so uh, time goes on. But uh, we lived in family student housing. I, I, I could walk them to uh, the child care center, uh, which was a wonderful, wonderful place for them to be. And uh, when Erin, the oldest one, entered kindergarten, there was an elementary school within walking distance. I could walk her to to kindergarten. Take Megan to childcare and then do the reverse at the end of the day. That really made it possible for me to be a, a graduate student at that time and a mother. And uh, I know that that's true for our students as well. Faculty and staff share those same needs. There are other benefits too to this project. It will recruit, reduce the housing pressure in Santa Cruz County. And once it's complete, about 2,000 of our current students would no longer be seeking out campus housing off or seeking housing off campus in the community. That helps sustainability. The project also includes an innovative recycled water system that will collect and treat and reuse wastewater generated from development uh, on campus. And that recycled water will be used to supply non-potable water uses helping us achieve the project's net zero water goal. We already know that housing students on campus um, is more efficient water-wise because of the practices we have on campus. And in fact, although the campus has grown um, in terms of its student enrollment over the last 25 years, we're using less water than we did then. So I hope that you'll ultimately agree with me about this project, but I'm a realist and I know that we may have to agree to disagree on this one. But I hope that we can find to our mutual respect and our common interest in doing, um, in doing what's best for our campus and especially our students. So with that, I'm glad to take uh, your questions or comments. Well, th well thank you, Cindy. So, so I'll ask one on this, this controversial topic. So Dan Friedman in the chat, Dan's an economist said, I'd be interested in knowing what was the best alternative to Housing West and why you decided it was not as good. Well, thank you, Dan. There, there are a couple of reasons for that. So having now a, a certified environmental impact report is just really a huge step to our being able to build housing. Without that, we can't do anything. So within that environmental impact report, the, there were five alternatives that were fully analyzed. 
Each of those alternatives is more expensive than the approved project. That's important, uh, not because um, the campus is, um, is cheap, uh, although I am cheap, I have to be honest. Uh, it's important because all the costs of housing, on-campus housing, are passed along to our students. So affordable student is really critical to be providing that access uh, to, to the students that we need to serve, to serve the people of California. The other aspect, um, that I struggled over was that all of the alternatives have as their premise and in their analysis that the family students would be uh, displaced from their current houses up at the top of the hill into the community. Now, George, in, in 2019, you might have had some qualms about that. But right now, I I I don't see how we could do that. I don't know where in the world they could go. Housing is at such a crisis and those family students are our, must, our most vulnerable, most vulnerable students among them. And so um, I'm, I, I, those two things together uh, really, um, really were important to me. And uh, with the approved project, who build the family student house, housing first, and then uh, that avoids that problem. Okay, so Linda Berman Hall. Hi, Hi um, and thanks for coming. I wanted to ask the chancellor if in the plans for fall, you have been able to consider the resumption of public events in our large spaces that normally would host public events, concerts, major lectures, and so on. Um, is it possible to require the, um, the vaccine cards like I've received of people who want to attend? Or have you decided to do this? And if so, how to do it for fall? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, we, we don't yet know what we're able to do. Um, I'm hoping that even those kinds of vaccine cards might not be necessary. I think we'll be wearing masks, but those we, we will be subject to state and county guidelines. And so um, it's a not always a matter of what we wish to do, but what we are able to do. I think though we can think about now, you know, baseball is gonna be open and uh, at, at a reduced amount that I, I'm really hopeful that by fall we can have large, even indoor events but I don't yet know, we don't yet know what we'll be allowed to do. Uh, outdoors yes. seems like that that will be easier, but many of those kinds of events like we'd like to hold don't exactly fit well into an outdoor outdoor venue. But uh, exactly. I'm specific about that. I'm specifically asking about indoor events. And I guess some of those spaces will have the ability to live cast for those who wouldn't want to come out yeah. or maybe live more distantly. Um, but hopefully you will be able to attend to deciding about this so that proper plans can be made. Yes, I hope so too. Uh, you know, the, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dynamic time that, that there are changes every day <laughs> in what it seems like we're allowed to do in the way that people are thinking. And I think that uh, you know, now it's March. I'm hopeful by uh, the beginning of summer, we'll have a lot more guidance and experience on those things. And so, uh, um, you know, as soon as we're able to make decisions, we will, we will share those with folks. Right now, our criti most critical issue is um, that we are, are focused on um, thinking about instruction for fall because the students, uh, ongoing students will be registering in, in, uh, in May, I think. So that's where our priority right now is. As part of that planning, we're, we're thinking about how, 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 do you, how do you populate lecture halls? Do we have large lectures? Uh, do you populate classrooms at 50% or can we be more like normal? I, I think we, we don't have answers to those questions yet either. But I think we'll get to uh, information from the community, you know, once uh, plays at, on Broadway open, once symphony halls can be 
reconstituted, all of those things that we all miss so deeply, that uh, that will give us guidelines too about what we're able to do among, uh, among uh, uh, the, the campus events that we all, we all like. Okay. Thank you. So Virginia, Virginia Jansen, and Virginia, you need to unmute yourself. I just did. Okay. Okay. Good morning, Cindy. Thank morning. you for sending the email that you plan to present to the Regents, the Student Housing West, plus the East Meadows section, um, as previously presented. As you know, and have said, this was not the solution that many of us were hoping for. Given how many people strongly oppose the solution, and especially including the opposition of the professional advisors, that is the design advisory board, which fulfills the region's order for professional guidance and physical planning. Why did you decide to continue this highly contested plan, which has caused so much delay in building this very, very much needed housing for students, but at the expense of destroying a critical part of campus land? that is the East Meadow area intrinsic to the basic design of the campus. And in effect, the very being of the campus. Why would you not remove this most contested part from the planned housing and instead go to the US Fish and Wildlife Service to ask for mitigation of habitat protected lands so that the West Heller site could accommodate the entire project? You, you did answer uh, these questions to some degree, but I'd like to hear more discussion on it. Also, you mentioned today a uh, commitment in the LRDP, the future LRDP to colleges, but this project destroys that experience for its residents. I just don't understand how you can reconcile these different items. Thank you in advance for your response. Thank you so much, Virginia. There's a lot there. I'm gonna try and address them yeah. sort of in pieces. Let's start with the last one first, the colleges. You know, I, I, I think that this actually supports the colleges. I'm a strong supporter of the colleges. The housing that we will be building is really for th of three forms. Um, family students, as we discussed, uh, graduate students who desperately need housing on campus and upper division students. Those upper division students, for the most part, don't live on campus. They live off campus in the community. By bringing them back onto campus, we can reaffirm their connection to the campus, but also to the colleges. So there, those, those apartments, this apartment style living, that's where students go in the community and they rent a house, they rent an apartment. Uh, we can organize that housing so that, for example, a wing or a floor is associated with the college. Those, those apartment students will have access to the, the dining services at Porter. We're also expanding the dining services at Rachel Carson. And I think that it is, a, it is an app opportunity for us to continue in the upper division student experience, a stronger connection to the colleges. So it won't be for first and second year students, those living arrangements. Uh, let's talk about the, the, uh, the issue that you brought up about the, uh, the take permits uh, that for, it was red-legged frogs who were found in the, on that site. That was uh, near uh, several years, I think, before the campus was um, really moved ahead with this project. So I don't know all the thinking that went into it at that point, why not to do that? I can tell you why not to do it now. It's because uh, that would mean that we would really be starting over with this project, right? That idea of getting a take permit and going back to the original project, it's not part of the environmental impact report that's now been uh, certified by the court. If we were to do that, that would then um, be a long delay, but more importantly, we live in a very litigious community. And that would open up the opportunity for further lawsuits based on the new environmental impact report. So we'd make one group of people happy, I'm sure, but there would be other groups who oppose any kind of growth or development on the campus who then would tie us up in court further. 
And as for building there on the East Meadow, you know, in the original plans of the campus, that was actually planned uh, as a development of professional schools. So I, I think that to say that it's not, that it's incongruous with the original plans of the campus, it's not the, the message that I have taken away from, from my readings of, of many of the original documents and LRDPs of the campus. Uh, the, um, the design advisory board does not favor that uh, and uh, that project. Um, this is a project that uh, I inherited uh, and I'm trying to do the best uh, that I can do for our campus uh, and our students, uh, given the constraints that, that I find myself in. Okay. So, so Sydney, <clears throat> let me ask one more on this controversial thing, and then mm -hmm. we maybe turn to some others. But this, the two questions that are related, and, and basically it's about controversial views of the data. So one question, Todd Whitkey, uh, are the cost of the alternatives available for us to see? And Faith Crosby asked, uh, each all, uh, all right, the claim is that each alternative is more expensive than the East Meadow, but we've seen data to the contrary. Basically, can we get access to those cost estimates and to the data? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure that I know. I, I know the answer to that, Barry. I, I think that uh, those uh, cost estimates that were likely part of the regents uh, discussion when the project originally went to the regents. We've looked at them and they've, they've held up um, uh, through our analysis, um, uh, but I don't know to what extent they're publicly available. Okay. Uh, Roger Kanaki, you had a different question. Can Roger, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I'm here. Do you want Roger? me to state the question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Chancellor, um, first of all, I'm uh, an associate member, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to ask a question. When I retired from Penn State, one of the trends that we were seeing was the uh, rapid increase of female students compared to male students. Um, this was uh, pretty significant among all the students, very, very, uh, marked among African-American students, way more females than males. Uh, and I'm curious if that is a trend you're also seeing at UCSC and what uh, the numbers might be for African-American, Hispanic and white students. Yeah, I was just looking to see if I could grab those numbers quickly. I'm, I'm not able to find them uh, on Google. I can get back to you, Roger. Let me just talk in general. I know that in general, we have about 50% of our undergraduates are female, 50% are male. I've also seen this disparity, particularly among African-American students. And I think it is a national uh, crisis of what's, what the trajectory is for young, uh, younger African-American men. And I, I worry that too many of them um, face um, challenges like incarceration. And, uh, but I don't, I don't have data about that for UC Santa Cruz, but I, I can follow up and share, find the website and share that information with Christy, who can then pass it along. We have all the numbers, I just don't have them exactly at my fingertips. I can tell you about, you know, the overall percentages of students in different categories, but not the breakdown between uh, female and male students. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I have one question myself uh, relating to the whole COVID shutdown. So as we all know, for, for many years, the economists have been telling the universities that they have to save money by using online education. It's a cheaper way to reach a lot of students. So we have been forced to have this massive experiment. And uh, part of the serious aspect of my question is, are we really data mining this. I mean, this should really be a real way to tell whether this kind of remote learning works. What, what are we finding out? Yeah, I, so I can point you to uh, Siddle's website, Keep On Teaching, if you really wanna dive into this. And they have done remarkable work. I would first say that for a university like UC Santa Cruz, uh, online education is not less expensive because we're not 
wanting to provide education that isn't uh, engaging, uh, involving interactions between faculty and students, TAs and students. And so uh, the push to online education, uh, in my view, is not about trying to do something less expensive. It's about trying to improve access. And one of the things that swayed me about that was a task force that I had at UC Riverside when we were thinking long before now the pandemic about increasing the amount of online courses. And that is that the most common uh, student pursuing an online degree, the most common demographic is a woman in her thirties with small children at home. That really resonated with me because of my own personal experience. And too often those types of students um, um, fall, I, I would say, um, prey in some ways to for-profit universities. So what we're thinking about at UC Santa Cruz is how do you have a mix of online and in-person experiences that give students pathways that, uh, that accommodate their life uh, realities, that uh, help them explore new areas, and help them uh, make progress towards their degree uh, and, and student success. What students in general will tell you uh, when you survey them is that uh, uh, even before the pandemic, they would like to have one course a quarter, sort of on average online. And sometimes it's not in their major, but it gives them this added flexibility for their work, for their family responsibilities, uh, also uh, sometimes to be engaged in activities like sports and student, student uh, research. Uh, we're thinking about that now for the future, how to be more nimble and, and uh, more accessible to students. SIDL has been surveying students and faculty, trying to th think about how do we make online experience that our students are all now feeling. How do we make that more engaging? What are the best practices? What do students think? There's a lot of information uh, from a survey they did both in the spring, which was you know not so great. They did one again in the fall, which, which was uh, showed much better results from students. And so the other thing I'm thinking about for the future is that we're going to now have university students and entering Frosh who experienced in high school uh, online and remote education. What will they find desirable I don't think that a residential university experience is going to be undesirable to many, many students. But is it going to look like the experience I had four years um, on the campus? Or will more students be wanting to come, <clears throat> maybe have their freshman experience, do a year abroad or an internship, um, uh, maybe mission work or, or volunteer work? While they're doing that, being able to have the, uh, um, the, the access to online courses so they continue making progress towards their degree. I think it's a really dynamic situation and uh, we're, we're gonna have to be uh, nimble <clears throat> and flexible as we plan for the future. Okay. I don't think for us, Mary, it's gonna save us money. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, a question from Mal Smith related <laughs> to the cost of student housing, I mean, Housing in town is terrible, but student housing is pretty expensive too. So, I mean, Al's specific question is, uh, the newspaper is stating, uh, stating a number about $1,600 a month. This seems high compared to the city. Are these numbers correct? Can, can campus housing be below the market uh, in the town? Uh, do some students get their housing paid, at least in part? Yeah, uh, there are there are some ways that that happens. If you're an RA, for example, you have free housing, <clears throat> but also you know financial aid uh, for many of our students um, pays the housing. Our housing actually, uh, you know, it's um, it depends. It's like you have to be careful how you compare it. So our housing uh, includes all utilities, right? It includes internet, includes all, uh, a lot of support services that students pay for when they're out in the community. It's also, uh, uh, they don't have to pay summer housing, right? We don't require, they have a 12 month contract. There's no damage deposits, right? So it's hard to make direct comparisons. We would like to have our housing be much more affordable. Uh, and uh, part of the housing, um, 
costs then are trying to, for every project, keep costs low. And as we get more housing that's paid for, then you're not paying the debt service on the housing. So campus housing at various universities in the UC system is at a variety of ages. Riverside, which is about 10 years older than Santa Cruz, uh, we had some old dormitories there and I suggested, well, we're building these new dorms, maybe we should just tear those old ones down. And I was informed uh, by folks who knew more than me that, uh, you know, actually those housing, that housing, since it's paid for, helps to subsidize the costs of the, of the new housing. So it's a, it's a, a kind of what, I, what they call a syndicated model in which that the students pay the same amount for their housing wherever they are on campus. And we do work very hard to try and keep it as, for, as affordable as possible. The same is true for um, the dining hall. Um, and uh, one of the advantages of on-campus apartments is many students will choose to, uh, to cook and they feel they can cook more cheaply uh, than they can uh, to have the dining hall services. Okay, Faye, you had a question? Yeah, I can maybe take one more then I'm afraid I've got to run. Okay. Thank you, I'll try to be brief. Uh, Cindy, thank you for coming to talk to us. And I want to praise you here, as I did in another forum recently, for the attention that you and Lori Kletzer give to organizational issues, the benefit of which we will see in a while. Uh, I, I want to ask one specific, very specific question. Why not house students from family student housing? Why not build RVT, a Rancheria Terrace too? temporarily house the students there while uh, as they are debouched from the west side of campus and then have them go to housing back on the west side. Well, that's an interesting idea, Faye. Um, I'm not uh, totally up to speed on Rancho Terrace too. I know it's something that we have in the study phase right now. If I remember properly, it would house about, it's about 39 or 40 units. So it's not going to be big enough. I think. And there were and the, and um, East Meadow had one more unit than Ranch View Terrace too, according to a public meeting last year. But we're I think talking about one about hundred and twenty families or or hundred and forty families in in the East Meadow, and so it you know those will be units that are designed for um, designed for uh, they're smaller. We don't want to build Rancho Terrace, I think, in that same way. I think that's housing designed for faculty and staff, as I understand it. But thank you for the suggestion. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll share it with others. Appreciate it. And it's so great to see you all today. And I hope that you're keeping well and uh, um, taking care. Um, you're important to all of us. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. And I hope next year we can, uh, we can all have lunch together. Oh, I hope so, too. I'll right. buy. <laughs> <laughs> all right we're recording this <laughs> all right well thank you everybody uh so uh april emeriti lecture with paul lubeck and see you in may for our final wrap-up hopefully our last zoom meeting uh and then we'll we'll all get together again in september so thank you everybody for participating bye bye Thank you again. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much.